And as he spoke, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and clubs, and sent from the chief priests and the ancients of the people. And he that betrayeth him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that is he, hold him fast. And forthwith, coming to Jesus, he said, Hail, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, whereto art thou come? Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and held him. In the history of the world, there has never been a more shameful betrayal than that of Judas Iscariot. Listen to Venerable Mother Mary of Agrida. In this one act of treason, Judas committed so many and such formidable sins that it is impossible to fathom their immensity. For he was treacherous, murderous, sacrilegious, ungrateful, inhuman, disobedient, false, lying, impious, and unequaled in hypocrisy. And all this was included in one and the same crime perpetuated against the person of God made man. When we examine the various betrayals down through history, we will find a pattern. It takes a Judas, a traitor, to initiate a passion. The patriarch Joseph was betrayed to his brothers and sold into slavery. Ahithophel, the counselor of King David, betrayed his king in counseling Absalom to rise up and kill his father, the king of Israel. David and the whole country entered into a passion, a civil war. Like Judas, Ahithophel hanged himself. In Rome, Brutus and Cassius betrayed Julius Caesar causing renewed civil wars to break out among the Romans. Not surprisingly, both Brutus and Cassius later committed suicide. Dante placed all three of the traitors, Judas, Brutus, and Cassius, in the very bottom of hell, in the mouth of Satan, in the very center of the earth. Liars, traitors, all. St. Joan of Arc seemed unstoppable. She steamrolled a path for the crown prince to be made king in a short two months. A miracle. But she let it be known the only thing she feared was treachery. Just as St. Bernadette, the only thing she feared was bad Catholics. And it came to pass... At Compiègne, as Joan foretold, they closed the gates on her too quickly, on purpose, it seems, thereby allowing her to be captured. Only then did she enter into her passion and death, from which France was eventually freed from English rule and overlords. Think about it. But all the efforts of the elders and high priests could not force over years the kiss of Judas accomplished in one night. What the English and Burgundians could not do to Joan, one of her own could do and did. There are important and deep lessons here on at least two levels. Namely, for the church as a whole, that's why I'm bringing this up, really. It's because we're in a passion. We need to understand that passion in relation to the passion of our Savior, and we will gain merit from it and the victory. But second of all, it's important for us as individual members of Holy Mother Church as well. The church is immortal. She cannot be put to death. That's very comforting. She is indefectible. As St. Catherine of Siena said so well, the sweet spouse of Christ has so much life in her 
that no one can put her to death. No one can do her to death. There are no bombs. There are no combination of bombs through all time that can blow her up. It's impossible. Yet she has passed through many dark and trying times, various passion ties down through history. How is this so? Each time she was betrayed, there it is. Each time she was betrayed by her own. Nearly every heretic and initiator of trial for Holy Mother Church has been a bishop, a priest, or a king. They're the ones that last. They're the ones that hurt the most. Arius, Martin Luther, Julian the Apostate, Henry VIII. We are once again in one of those passion tied moments. There must be a Judas or Judases around. They say there's one in every 12. May we not be surprised at this. May we not be scandalized. I tell you, that's the easiest way to answer anyone who says, oh, you're a Catholic? Look at all those bad bishops. You say, there's a Judas in every 12. We're not surprised. You think you're going to get away without having a Judas in your family? In your little church? Wherever you go? Guess again. We've been here before This is important for keeping our sanity. The church cannot die. She will live on. But then there's our own soul, too. After baptism, the faithful soul fortified by the sacraments. Regular, pious spiritual exercises. Study, penance. Making that desert trek from the Red Sea to the Promised Land with all the difficulties. It's been fortified. It's a fortress with all these sacraments, sacramentals, spiritual exercises, study and penance. It's hard to penetrate if we use them well. It's a fortress. The devil knows it. So it's not the devil who brings down such souls. No, as the imitation of Christ says, we are our own worst enemies. The devil can only use us, that is, our faults, our inordinate desires and affections against us. He finds them, and then he turns them on us. That's what he did to Judas. He found his weakness, that he had only entered into a friendship of utility with our Lord. And when the utility was ending, and he saw it with Mary Magdalene, He decided, I need to take advantage of this for my own benefit. And off he went to sell our Lord. So we too can play the Judas inside by betraying Christ in the garden of our souls and kill him by committing mortal sin. And this initiates both spiritual and physical trials. It initiates a passion, a night of darkness. It may even eventual diabolical possession. Oh, what sorrow must we have caused his sacred heart by our first sin. The loss of our baptismal innocence. This is the reason St. Philip Neri said daily, Watch out for Philip today, Lord, or he will betray thee. Help me not be a Judas, is what he's saying. I know I'm capable of it. Thus he prayed that he would never be a Judas. Now, seeing that this need for a betrayer is accurate, To initiate a passion, let's try to be more specific, more practical, I suppose, about the ingredients, if we want to call them that, of such passions. So we see that the church is going through these dark trials down through time. 
What are the ingredients that make this possible? Because we want to make sure we have nothing to do with these ingredients. Well, we just said the number one on the list that makes it possible is the betrayal from deep within. Nay, even from the sanctuary of the church or the inner sanctum of our hearts or even of our families, we start by betraying others before we get bigger betrayals. Look at the lives of the Judases that have been uncovered. Look at their lives. They did not live well as children. They did not do well in their own homes. Betrayal must come from deep within. Nay, even from the sanctuary of the church or inner sanctum of our hearts. This is Judas. It cannot start without him. That's the first ingredient. But when we look at Judas, the second ingredient, we find he's betrayed himself first. He cannot betray others unless he's already betrayed himself. That is, gives way to disappointment, discouragement from failed expectations, from a friendship of utility or advantage, a friendship of pleasure. Pleasure ends, utility ends. Well, I'm going to get something out of this. You're not serving my needs. Failed expectations. He wanted some advantage from his majesty or the church, we can think. Did not appear. I'm going to recoup my losses by making a deal with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Number three, the betrayer then commits himself to work within the organization. He looks around to see who's organized to help him out. Make some kind of a deal. Seeks out the elders, the priests, the scribes of like mind. To work at isolating. We'll talk about that in a moment. But we're looking for well-established situations in the worldly ways that will help me get what I want. And number th- four... Numbers are needed. We need numbers if we're going to win. Thus, they organize opposition to get a majority. Inside our souls, the passions and those that want their way, get everybody organized to help them out. They make the reason find why I'm right. Why this is the right way. And everybody else around me is wrong. Father's wrong in confession. That's a hard parish I go to. They're wrong. I got to figure it out. And I'll get an organization, get a, a united inside, get a democracy going in there. Get a democracy going in the family. Get a democracy going around me. Pretty soon we're going to the priest or the parent or the leader. We're right and you're wrong. You better change. Passion. That's part of a Passion. Numbers are needed. They came to our Lord in a large number. They organized opposition to get a majority, to isolate, to divide, to restrain the one holding his ground. Number five, lying. False witnesses will be required since the church and her divine head are spotless, they're immaculate, they're sinless. And so are her laws, and so are her ways. But you're going to have to lie. You're going to have to deceive yourself, to play a shell game, to have your way. Number six, doctrine will be, need to be denied or belittled. While men's, res, men's reasoning powers and ideas will be promoted. It is reason, science standing over faith. Human, human authority trumping God's authority. Number seven, the state will be required. We'll have to go to Pilate. Politics will become everything. Number eight, God needs to get permission, which he will not do unless it is for a greater good. These permissions are normally gained through the lying, 
through the heresy, through the vice, making man king in place of God. We do these things and the devil's all over it. And he gets the permissions to keep going. And finally, the occult is required for such passions to carry on, the passions of the church. Thus we hear at the time of the betrayal how Satan entered Judas, and it was night. The passion will then break out into the open with the arrests, with the mocking, the ridiculing, the slapping, the beating, the stripping of his majesty, and ultimate death. This is happening to the church now. It's coming out in the open. But then, never lose hope, dearly beloved. Then comes the return of the king of kings in short order. The harrowing of hell, the conquering of the darkest souls and kingdoms in the world. A passion always precedes a time of grace, a time of peace, Stay tuned. We are in a passion. It means a victory must be in the offing.